千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Dao De Jin Twenty Six. Heaviness is the root of lightness. Quietness is the master of restlessness. Therefore, the sages travel an entire day without leaving the heavy supplies, even though there are luxurious sights. They are composed and transcend beyond. How can the lords of ten thousand chariots apply themselves lightly to the world? To be light is to lose one's foot root. To be restless is to lose one's mastery. So twenty six is a relatively short chapter with only ten lines. So, are there some repeating characters that we can spot to help us identify how the chapter breaks out into sections? So, I would say yes. Let's take a look from the top. It should be fairly easy to see. First of all, that the first two lines have the same number of characters, four characters, and. Secondly, they have a repeating character, translated as is, is, in both line one and line two. So that pattern is not seen again below line two. There's no more reiterating character in the second position, and we don't get back to the four character length until line four. So that probably denotes. That here in line one and two we have a section like that. So what about the other parts? Are there other repeating characters? Let me pause for a moment and ask everyone to take a look. If you spot them, please feel free to type them out in the question section and share your discovery with the world. So if you look further down, you will definitely see that we have another place with repeating pattern. It's actually、uh, toward the very end. So I'm highlighting them now, so you can see it easily. Line nine and line ten are both four characters in length, and the second and third characters. Repeat from line to line, so that's a pretty good indication to us that this is another section. So from line three to line eight, we don't see a whole lot of patterns. So then the next thing we have to do is to read closely as to what it says, and we、uh, we can tell that they can also be organized into patterns. Why? Well, one way to tell is that. When we pay attention to seven and eight, both lines have six characters. So, when we read the translation, how can the lords of ten thousand chariots apply themselves lightly to the world? Well, that's definitely a complete thought. So we can say that right here. Seven and eight are a small section. Then we begin to be able to tell that perhaps this entire chapter is ten lines in five couplets. That is five pairs of two lines each. 
That's accurate. We can bring in another division here. You know, it's a thinner line that I'm using. And then as you can see, if you look at the translation to the right hand side, therefore the sages travel an entire day without leaving the heavy supplies. That's one thought. Then another thought, even though there are luxurious sites, they are composed and transcend beyond. You know, they're not tempted by the sites. That's another thought. Then we get to the 10,000 chariots, that the lords of the 10,000 chariots have to be serious in, a, in applying themselves. Yet another thought. So looking at this whole thing, we see two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines. Five divisions of two lines each. And that's how we that's how we sectionally analyze this particular chapter. <clears throat> so next, let's take a look at the at Dao De Jing 26 line by line and figure out what it's supposed to mean. Let's start with the very first character. That character is a common character in Mandarin. It's called, it's uh, pronounced Zhong. And the meaning is heavy. Primary meaning is heavy as in weight, so heavy weight, or heaviness in general. So in this context, it has a specific meaning. It means serious intent, deep thinking, and gravitas. So zong, heavy, here means thinking about a topic heavily. And we also have its complement. In the same line, the third character is the opposite of heavy. So you would uh, probably figure out the meaning as light. You will be correct. The pronunciation in, in, uh, for this particular character is qing. Pinyin is qing, but it's actually, it actually sounds, it's supposed to sound like ching. So this is not quin. This is not king, it's qing. So the meaning is the opposite of zhong. It means light, lightweight, lightness, as opposed to heaviness. So let's continue on. I want to talk about, so, you know, we've, we've talked about how zong, heaviness, that is in the context of serious thoughts being applied to weighty topics in life. The very question of life and death, the question about existence, where do we come from? What is our purpose here? Where are we going? Questions about destiny. These are weighty topics and serious contemplation of them it's the context behind zong, heaviness. So qing, the lightweight stuff, this is the opposite. So in this context, this character means being frivolous, superficial, and feeling transient emotions and moods. And by transient here, I mean emotional, emotional uh, transient feelings that come and go. That's the best way I can describe it. Moods that change very quickly. One moment you are feeling a particular thing, sadness, the, the, the next moment you are laughing maniacally. Uh, so anything that's, that's here and then it's gone, that's transient, that's impermanent. It's being frivolous, it's being superficial. There's nothing very deep about any of this. So in line one, it's saying that heaviness is the root of lightness. So if you understand the context of heaviness and lightness in terms of thoughts, in terms of feelings and emotions, then now you can figure out why heaviness will be seen as the root. 
Heaviness or gravitas being the roots denotes its importance in human affairs. Agreements are made with solemn promises. Treaties and laws are signed with deliberate thoughtfulness and so on. So keep in mind that one does not preclude the other. Just because you are serious about something doesn't mean that everything is very somber um, and that there, that there can be no happiness or celebration involved. So the best example that I can think of is that in life, there are many combinations that are both serious, but also celebrations. A wedding is actually a great example. So think about how people go into a wedding. Chances are they've given it some serious thought. They are committing their lives with another person, building a life together. These are, these are not things to be taken on lightly. And yet at the wedding itself, there are jokes, there's music, there's socializing, there's general happiness and celebration. So the two can come together, but notice one thing about the wedding. The celebration, the lightness, the happiness of the wedding is built on top of the solemn promise of two people to one another as the basis or the foundation. So in human affairs, you always find this to be the case. If it's a worthwhile thing, then it's gonna have heaviness, gravitas at the bottom of it as a solid foundation. And then you build other things on top of it, which can include lightness. But if you have lightness without an underlying foundation, then it will easily collapse, it will easily dissipate and go nowhere. Let's keep, let's keep it moving. So in line two, I want to bring out this character, which is the last character. This character is Jun. In pinyin, it's written as J-U-N. So I know that native speakers will say Jun or, or June, like the month of June. The month of June is the closest one to Jun. Um, it's not exactly the right sound, but it's it's the closest one we can manage because this is one of the hardest sounds in Mandarin for a non-native speaker to make. Jun. So closest would be like June, like the month of June. So Jun, what does that mean? Jun is ruler, lord, master. So Jun Wang, that could be a king. And overall, the lording and um, mastering is the context of this particular character. And you'll see the, the mastering concept uh, a lot more in this particular chapter. So let's, let's analyze line two. Line two says quietness is the master of restlessness. Let's explore what that means. First, this is line two in a couplet. So you have to reference back to line one. Line one talks about the serious is far more important in the Tao than the superficial. So just as that is the case, being quiet is far more valued, far more emphasized in the Tao than being restless. Of course, you might say, well, the serious and the superficial, the quiet and the and the restless, they're all in the Tao. Are they not? Indeed, they are all part of the Tao. The Tao encompasses all. But just because they're all in the Tao, it doesn't mean that they're equally useful in different contexts. Here, it's the context of human affairs, serious business, life and death. So the bottom line is this, all things exi exist in the Tao, but they may not all be equal to one another.
So now, with line one and line two, we've isolated two characters. There is the heaviness, and then there's the quietness. The first two characters, the first characters in, in both lines denotes the aspects of uh, things that exist in the DAO that deserve special attention. So this is basically saying that the proper emphasis of the DAO is on the following. One, the DAO favors the thoughtful over the thoughtless. The DAO is about deep feelings over fleeting moods. So the depth of one's feelings means that those feelings are true and lasting and constant. Fleeting moods come and go. They are unpredictable, they're random. That which is not lasting is also not the Tao. That which is congruent or in tune with the Tao, that can last. Three, careful consideration over random choices. So the Tao is about going into something with your eyes wide open. After you've considered all different aspects of it, it's not about being random. It's not about following your whims. That would be the lightness without a foundation. And four, in-depth engagement over faddish dabbling. So when you have heaviness, that means you are invested in something and you want to look into it deeply and you want to engage fully with it, faddish doubling is the opposite. It means that uh, like a dilettante, you are just dabbling in something, you're just getting the surface level, the flavor of it, without really giving it a lot of time. You're following a fad. So that's not the Tao. The Tao is about being fully immersed and being consistent week after week, day after day. So those that can stay in this particular course for the long term, they demonstrate that aspect of the Tao. And just a couple more. Emphasis of the Tao favors dignified composure over fidgety agitation. So think about someone who is being fidgety, who's like tapping you know, with the finger or with the foot, uh, someone who can stay still, you will not assign a particular uh, great amount of gravitas to this person or composure or dignity. So the Tao is about dignified composure, even in the face of chaos. And then we have quiet observation over impulsive action. So the Tao cultivator learns to look at things quietly and not give in to childish impulse to just do whatever that comes to mind. And lastly, we've got calm composure over chaos. So I find, I find it quite surprising that after years of studying the Tao that people most often associate calm composure to me. Even people that uh, don't really know that I study the Tao, they just somehow get the idea that I am very calm, which is true, especially when it comes to disasters. So in my, in my line of work, oftentimes there are things that happen that can quickly devolve into a crisis. Uh, from a technology perspective. So people are constantly uh, looking to me to basically manage the process, manage the crisis, so it doesn't get out of hand. And when that happens, I find that the study of the DAO comes, into, uh, comes in handy so much, that it helps me so much. Uh, I am very appreciative of that. I pretty much have taken it for granted, so I don't think about it. So when people 
when people write about me and then talk about how I am like the calmest person uh, they know, it, it always is kind of a pleasant little surprise to me. So let's move on. And here we have uh, an interesting historical issue that I want to share with you. Line three says, therefore, the sages travel an entire day. Uh, there are editions of the Tao Te Ching that use Junzi instead of Shenren. So Junzi means a gentleman, a mensch, a person of honor. So it's possible that the original was written for that, but it's hard to say because even in the oldest editions of the Tao Te Ching that we have, both appear. Junzi is a term that deserves special notice because uh, if you study Chinese culture, you will come across Junzi all the time. It's a cultural ideal. The cultural ideal about someone who has a code of honor, someone who will be always in the uh, walk the straight and narrow, someone that you can absolutely trust all the time. It's a cultural ideal. So because of the influence of Confucius, a lot of times throughout Chinese history, this term is seen as a Confucian gentleman or a gentleman of honor who follows Confucian teachings. But if you plug it back into this particular chapter, you will see that it's, uh, you can easily see it's not correct. It would not be a Confucian gentleman traveling the, the entire day without leaving heavy supplies. The reason why you will be incorrect is because at the time of the writing of the Tao Te Ching, at the time that the Tao Te Ching was written, uh, Confucius uh, had, uh, had not, uh, was not uh, known as anything other than one of the many students of the Tao. So Confucian teachings had not become widespread, had not become a standard among scholars of ancient China. So Junzi itself, it's a very old term. It, it goes back thousands of years before the time of Confucius or the time of Laozi. It's always meant a person of honor. So either way, whether it's Shenren or Junzi, the actual meaning here is, as you see in the translation, sage. It's talking about a person of honor who practices and masters the Tao. So this person does not leave the heavy supplies. And that requires a little bit more explanation. What does it mean when you say someone does not leave the heavy supplies? Before we get to the heavy supplies, let's make sure we wrap up line three to talk about zhong ru xing, travel an entire day. What is that? What does that mean? Well, when you work with the Tao Te Ching enough, you pretty much have figured out uh, by this point that the references on uh, about uh, travel, about journey, etc., they're all metaphorical in nature. So when you say travel an entire day, it's not physical traveling necessarily. It's not about a trip that you undertake in the physical world, it's actually talking about the journey through life. So the sages, when they travel an entire day, meaning when they, when they walk their own journey of life, they do so in a specific way that is Tao-like, all right? So it's worth noting that the journey of life is something that we all have in common. You're traveling through the journey of life, and so am I. We're all moving toward death as soon as we are born, so we're all on that same journey. It's just that those who know the Tao travel in a different way, a different way that is better. So based on the previous two lines, you know, about heaviness, right? Um, about quietness, 
we know or we can figure out, we can guess that a traveler who knows the DAO will be, will be in that gravitas mindset. That is, will be serious minded and careful and cautious and deliberate. Uh, they will pick and choose the right path. They wouldn't do it randomly. They wouldn't do it based on a whim. So they would travel better in that sense. And that, that would be excellent. So what else? What else would be true about the people that know the Tao? How would they travel through life differently? Well, the answer is line number four. They don't leave the heavy supplies. So here we need to we need to be very clear on exactly what heavy supplies are. And just like the journey of life, traveling the entire day, the heavy supplies not meant to be literal. It is also metaphorical. So let's figure out what the metaphor is supposed to be. If we had an actual trip in the physical realm, in the material world, the heavy supplies will be the basics, will be the food rationing, will be containers, perhaps tools, cookware that we're gonna need for the trip. So in modern times, it depends on the trip. When you go on a trip, your heavy supplies may include gear for camping, climbing, hunting, fishing, scuba diving, you know, depends on the trip. Now, for an army on the march, it would also include weapons, armor, and ammunition. So I think now with the three examples for the actual trip, for a camping excursion, for the marching army, you have a pretty good idea now, the flavor of heavy supplies. Heavy supplies means the essentials for the trip. So now let me challenge everyone with this question. What would be the essentials for the trip if we're talking about the journey of life? So let me pause for a moment to let that question sink in and then we'll explore some of the answers together. All right, so let's get further into the heavy supplies. What will be the essentials? What will be the heavy supplies for, for the life journey? So let me give you some examples of what I see. And uh, I think uh, if you think of additional essentials for the journey of life, uh, I want to invite you to uh, type it in. So first, an essential for your journey in life Maybe the fundamental values that you hold near and dear to your heart. Because after all, these are the values that define who you are. So you never want to be without, without these. You never want to get too far away from these. These are the essentials. What else? Faith, beliefs. Now, if you consider yourself to be non-religious, well, you probably still have a philosophy of life. So that would be, that would be uh, in place of having some sort of religious faith. So either way, whether you are religious or not, there's going to be some central set of beliefs that's going to be very essential to your journey in life. So if it's the Tao, congratulations. I'm in the same, I'm, I'm in the same boat. It's essential to me. So for those of you who uh, think about values like humility, love, compassion, wonderful. These are, these are the foundational values that we all need. The Tao itself, a regular practice to keep you close to the Tao. The study of the Tao, Tai Chi, Qigong, these can all be the essentials. So if you have come up with those, congratulations, you are exactly on the right track. You are getting a very good sense of exactly what the heavy supplies ought to be. Uh, and let me show a little more of what I uh, have prepared previously. 
your talents, skills, knowledge, and expertise for your means of livelihood and career. After all, it's well, I'm talking about the basics and the fundamentals and noting that we're all here and we all need to make a living. So you need to bring your talents, skills, knowledge, and expertise into it. Uh, we can't be too far away from that because we have that need to make a living. Now, what about goals, dreams, purpose, meaning, visions, aspirations in life? Well, yeah, those are essential. Those are fundamental. Those are basic. If you are without them, you drift this way and that in life. It's, uh, it's actually a painful thing. So that's part of the, the fundamentals, part of the essentials, without a doubt. And let's not forget family, friends, loved ones. Can't forget them, cannot neglect them. They are the essentials for your life journey. So when we talk about how the sage, when they travel through life, they never, they never uh, leave the, the essentials. That tells you that the sage is a person of substance, that the sage is not about fluff or a facade or a false front. So in general and in practice, you'll find that sages, genuine sages have a genuine concern. They are concerned about people and they're also concerned about what is true and proven as opposed to what looks good. And we'll get to uh, what looks good you know, a little bit later on called Rongguan. So this is the reason why the Tao is a subject for serious study because people wanna know what is this about the Tao? You know, what has withstood the test of time for thousands of years? What actually works? This is the question that I'm always asking when I explore the Tao. You know, never mind the trapping of stylistic elements. I want to know the essence. I want to know what actually works. So what I have found is just that. The Tao teachings that work across time, across cultural boundaries, they worked in ancient China, they work in the modern world. So this whole mindset, this, this uh, slide is titled The Mind of a Sage. This entire mindset is very similar to the scientific mindsets in the West. So it's sort of the spiritual counterpart to the scientific method. And that's why I say in the West, this will be the equivalent to seeking genuine scientific findings from double blind studies, double blind experiments. Uh, to be double blind means that even the experimenter don't know what is being sought, what answer is being sought, and therefore will not be in a position to influence those who are uh, the subjects of the experiment. So that's all I want to say about the heavy supplies. Let me do um, let me do just a couple more slides, and that's probably the the time that we want to uh, allocate for 26 today. So now I want to talk about this whole idea of not leaving the heavy supplies. To not leave the heavy supplies means losing, not without ever losing sight of the fundamentals. To leave the heavy supplies, uh, possibly to lose the heavy supplies is to lose your way, lose your connection to the, to the essential fundamentals in life. So masters of the Tao never lose sight of that, the truly important things. As an example, they pay attention to the physical body in order to keep it healthy. That's fundamental, that's basic. If you are constantly suffering from ill health, your mind cannot be at its best to study the Tao, to understand the Tao, so that's basic. 
be listened to, take care of, and spend quality time with close friends and family. That's basic. That's fundamental. Can't do without it. Once they have worked out their code of honor or principles, they hold true to them and will not compromise. To compromise will be to leave sight of the heavy supplies. So, so far, these would probably all strike everyone as common sense, but think about the people who have neglected their health as a result of their focus or obsession on material wealth. That would be missing out on the first bullet there, not paying attention to the physical body to keep a healthy, that's losing sight of the fundamentals. And what about those who, because of job demands and requirements, neglect the family? That is missing out on the second bullet that you see there. They don't listen to, take care of, or spend quality time with close friends and family. So in each one of these, we see many examples in real life about the people who drift away from their own heavy supplies, from their own essentials and fundamentals. So lastly, another way to see the value of the fundamentals on the part of uh, Dow Masters is that they value the, the intangibles, such as integrity, obligations, duty, and they value the intangibles much more highly than material things. In the Western world, we may say, we may use an expression like, you know, you can take that, you can take uh, someone's promise to the bank. Uh, that's actually equating the value of a promise to the value of money that you take to the bank. For the Dow cultivators and the Dow sages, the value of a promise is considerably higher than the value of money. All right, so I think we have time for one more slide and that's probably gonna be it today. But this one's interesting, Guan. So let's take a look, the opinion uh, the O that you see there, R-O-N-G, that's the O sound. So it's wrong, not, not wrong, not, not like, it doesn't rhyme with the wrong in right or wrong. It's wrong. Guan, what does that mean? What do these characters mean? Well, wrong, the first character is glorious, luxurious, and then Guan, the second character, is to look, to see, is sight. So together, it's a glorious sight. There is a specific meaning on this. It means the sight, the glorious sight of a grand palace. That is the original meaning. And this has been generalized to mean sights of attractive luxuries in general. So. As you travel the journey of life, you will come across Guan. You will see these things that appear to be very attractive. All the material temptations have this in common. They all present themselves as Guan. So this term is no longer used in modern Mandarin. Uh, no one will, if you were to interact with modern Mandarin speakers, uh, no one will describe anything as, as Guan. This is a very ancient term, no longer used. So the effect that Guan has on most people is that it causes people to veer off the path, veer off their path, because these are temptations and distractions. They can be very powerful. They can be very distracting. So before you know it, you are attracted by the sights and sounds and you are no longer on the path that you should be on. So a lot more to talk, to talk about uh, in this particular respect. We're only on line five. So next time we're gonna have to pick it up again from here and talk about uh, Yan Chu. And yen is, is a bird. We'll talk more about that next time. So with uh, just a few minutes remaining, let's uh, jump to the summary. So because today we have spent quite a bit of time to wrap up 
25, and we got into 26 a little bit, I want to present two summary slides. One is about, is about 25. So the last summary that I would offer for 25, seven ideas to keep in mind. The Tao is formless. It's non-physical, cannot be heard, seen, or touched. So the key word is formless. And then we have the Tao is eternal. Key word is eternal. The Tao existed before anything, has always been, and always will be. Number three, key word is constant. The Tao is constant. The, the Tao is changeless. It gives rise to the concept of time, but it is timeless in itself. Number four, key word is nameless. We call it the Tao for the lack of a better, more descriptive name. So Tao is just a label. Number five, it is the ultimate source of everything. Keyword is source. Number six, keyword is independence. The Tao is independent. It is self-reliant. It has everything that it needs. It's self-sufficient. It requires nothing from anyone. And lastly, number seven, its function is circular. Keyword is circular. The Tao moves in circles, great and small. Sometimes in circles that are too great for us to see, but it's moving. So this is the, uh, the last summary of chapter 25. Because today we also cover chapter 26, I want to offer a second and final summary for today, which combines reminders from 25 uh, and 26. The very last part of 25 talks about how the Tao follows the laws of nature. The Tao is natural. And because we apply the cosmic to the personal, it means that you must also follow your nature. Specifically, this means cultivating the existing aspects of your nature at your highest, most noble, and most compassionate. What I'm describing here is your best possible self, yourself at the highest level, at the most noble and most compassionate level. So how do you cultivate your best possible self? Two ways, one from 25, one from 26. From 25, cultivate your greatness. Suggestion, watch yourself for moments of being petty, small-minded, or small hearted. That is not who you really are. You are great. From 26, gravitas. This means being serious. Guard against being excessively chatty, gossiping, or rumor mongering. And when faced with decisions, approach with gravitas. That means decide carefully and hold to your position with confidence because of the care that you put into your decision. Do not be easily swayed. If you have done the deciding part correctly, you will not be easily swayed. So possess gravitas and possess greatness. Those are the initial um, summary that covers, that spans bridges 25 and 26. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.